Hello, today on the final bar, we'll have a level up segment where we're going to talk about the gallery view part of stockcharts.com. We'll talk about fishing for alpha using the scanning engine, a couple scanning ideas for you. Also, in the spirit of crypto week, we're going to hear from Tom Lee from Fundstrat talking about how you could value cryptocurrencies related to the charts. Uh, all that and more uh, here on the final bar. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. My name is Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks so much for joining us today and every day on our show, uh, every weekday, 4 o'clock Eastern. Um, interesting day today. We had a nice uh, sell-off out of the open, but then a nice rally back to close uh, above the close from yesterday. So a bit of a you know retest of the, of the distribution we saw earlier, but overall finishing in a position of strength. So we're going to look at the charts of the S&P again, as always, connect what we're seeing today versus the long-term trend and make sure we connect the short-term to the long-term, have a proper perspective. This is Crypto Week on Stock Charts TV, so we're going to hear from Tom Lee, who's a strategist down at Fundstrat uh, over in New York. Uh, I sat down with him a couple weeks ago down in Las Vegas. We talked about uh, Bitcoin and a number of different ways to value cryptocurrencies. I thought some of his comments were really, really interesting related to the charts that we've been looking at. So how do you combine the fundamental with the technical? So we hear from him. Also, a couple segments trying to get you to uh, find ideas more effectively, more efficiently uh, using stock charts. So fishing for alpha, we'll use the scanning engine. Uh, also, we'll uh, do a level up segment where we talk about uh, the gallery view, which is one of my favorite parts of the uh, platform. So a lot of really good stuff to dig into. Let's get right to the charts. So today, as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, a bit of a, uh, you know, move down, but by the end, we're back up to the top. So again, I would, as a candlestick aficionado, you probably have names for these. I'll randomly share with you uh, when I see them and they jump off the page. But to be honest, when I taught candlestick analysis to uh, new analysts, to, uh, to students, I always encourage them, don't worry too much about the naming of them, which some people get really wrapped up in. Worry more about what it's telling you. But, you know, candlesticks are really interesting about telling you the short-term supply demand picture for a specific stock, for a specific price series. So seeing where we're at relative to the trend and then seeing where we're at open and close relative to the range for the day. That's what candles are designed to tell you. Just telling you about the next couple days. So overall, we sold off out of the open. We rallied back and saw some accumulation going into the close. Let's look at the intraday chart. This is the S&P, uh, the spiders going back for the last five days. So here's the gap down on Tuesday. This was Monday's session, which sold off out of the open. Big gap down on Tuesday uh, after uh, U.S.-China rumors. The reverse of those rumors allowed the uh, uh, equity markets to rally uh, on Wednesday. And now we have Thursday's session with a little move higher, but a sell-off. So remember, the first 30 minutes tells you a lot about reaction to overnight news, reaction to earnings. Re you know, A lot of retail investors are making moves then. And so it's sort of a read of the emotion of the market. So certainly more distributive in the first 30 minutes. But then look what happened since then. We sort of settled into a nice period of accumulation. And for the rest of the day, sort of slow and steady on the way, on the way higher. The last hour was, uh, was an up hour, sort of finishing, you know, four o'clock finished higher than three o'clock. And again, it's a very simplistic way of just seeing, you know, what are institutions doing, the ones that are putting in uh, some of the volume at the end of the day. So overall, you know, certainly uh, nothing negative here, no real follow through to the downside after, you know, Tuesday's session, it's been, oh man, when are we going to see sort of that downside follow through? We talked about that on the show Tuesday. We haven't seen that yet. And I think today also does not sort of confirm that downside. Um, now, there are plenty of places where we've seen um, some interesting movements. We're going to look at the Mindful Investor Live chart list here for a moment, um, just to uh, orient ourselves to the long-term trend. Uh, again, it's, there's a reason why the very first chart on this chart list is a very long-term, a five-year weekly chart of the S&P 500. If you are a long-term investor, which I think many of us are listening today, you should be starting your process every day, every week with something long-term that matches your investment horizon. It's so easy to get caught up in the short-term, the flickering ticks of the market, and then you start to make long-term decisions based on the short-term read. What you wanna do is make sure you're orienting yourself to the proper 
time frame. So I look at a lot of weekly charts, even monthly charts, to start from the big picture and then go in. And so overall, even with all the volatility, even with the sell-off earlier this week, overall the trend is undeniably positive from a long-term perspective. So don't forget that. All the other things we see sort of fit into that paradigm of the long-term uptrend. This is a chart we haven't looked at in a little while. This is the S&P breadth by cap tier. So this is the closing price of the S&P 500, some moving averages. And then below here, we have the cumulative advanced decline line for the S&P, for the New York Stock Exchange, for the mid cap index, and for the small cap index. And one of the themes we've talked about for a while has been this relationship between large cap and small cap and how small cap a lot of times when you would expect it to be leading the way higher really has not been. If you look at just the month of November into the first week of December here where we're at, you can see that the breadth on small caps has been fairly positive. The breadth on mid caps has been a little positive, but the, the pullback uh, this week sort of gets it back to flat for the month. But look at how small caps have actually rotated lower a little bit. So you have another one of these divergences with large caps, mega caps leading the way, less by mid cap, less by small cap. And again, that on its own is not a raging sell signal, but it certainly tells you the characteristics of the market in a way that I would be, uh, I would be paying attention to. Wanted to, I'm going to jump around just for a moment here. Forgive me for that. But I wanted to show you in the sentiment read uh, Thursday. So we've had the new AAII rankings come out. This is the ratings, the, the rankings uh, where people are surveyed, individual investors, are you bullish, bearish, or neutral on stocks for the next six months? And what happened is we had kind of a narrowing, less bulls, less bears. And so if you want to think about what, how indecision would be reflected on the charts, that's kind of it. When this line comes in and you have less bulls and less bears, there's less people making a bet on either side or the other. And I think that is certainly how the market feels, sort of in a period of, uh, of indecision. To wrap up here, let's look at just some of the, the basic themes. So the S&P up about 15 basis points. That's essentially flat for the day. Um, small caps up a little more, mid caps up uh, a little bit less. So, you know, small caps had actually led the way up today. But overall, again, the trend is what we're, we're thinking about. Sectors that are up, financials, materials, communication, services, all up bigger than the market, followed by tech. At the bottom, though, I think, interestingly, we have energy, which has consistently been toward the bottom. I'm not too surprised by that. But look at how consumer staples and consumer discretionary both sort of flat to down. So again, we have this situation where both of the consumer groups are all sort of moving in lockstep. We don't have as much differentiation as you'd uh, potentially like to see from, uh, from those things. In terms of what was up or down the most, footwear, the number one industry group, a nice gap up on some of those charts. Look at Nike and some others if you haven't in a while. Some interesting patterns emerging there, almost a basing pattern, a cup and handle pattern on the little preview. But also note some of these mining groups that are up at the top of the list. These are up 2% on a day that's essentially flat. So gold mining, mining stocks. Again, if you've not looked at some of those, the patterns are starting to be more constructive. Gold also in a really compelling long-term uh, pattern. So some interesting groups that have emerged today may be worth seeing if those uh, continue into, uh, into further sessions leading into year end. That's our market recap for today. I wanted to continue on the show with a session, a segment called Level Up. This is one of my favorite segments because what it allows us to do is improve our use of the stock charts platform. Uh, and again, I've been using the platform a, a lot since working more closely with stock charts over time. I've learned a lot from some of my mentors uh, like Greg Schnell, Arthur Hill, Tom Boley, who are you know, maestros at using this platform. But I'm trying to pick up everything I can from my, from my coworkers here, from fellow contributors. And I wanted to share with you one of my favorite parts of it, which is the gallery view. The gallery view essentially gives you a rundown of how a security, especially a stock, looks in different time frames in a way that might be helpful. I, I find a lot of people don't pay enough attention to different time frames. I'm going to bring up the gallery view and I'll share with you. When I sat down with Brian Shannon from Alpha Trends, this was uh, down in uh, Las Vegas not too long ago, uh, we were talking about uh, multiple time frames. He wrote a really uh, fantastic book on multiple time frames. And this is what we sort of got to. A lot of times you get focused in on your time frame. You're a swing trader and you forget to look at the daily perspective or the weekly perspective. And this, the weekly, the monthly is where I find people don't spend nearly enough time. That's where you really understand how the stock relates to the business cycle, how sectors come in and out of favor, all those important things. So I'm gonna orient you to what the gallery view does. I'm gonna show you how you can customize it to make it a little more uh, relative and, and then more importantly, how you can use it to compare different stocks in, different, uh, in, the, in the same group or in different groups. So I'm bringing up Electronic Arts, ticker EA. When you bring it up, it's gonna to default to some preset charts that we've tended to find people, people find valuable. 
So here we have uh, electronic arts, the intraday chart. I'm looking at the last three days here. And again, your chart on your system may look a little different depending on how we've both customized it. We then have a daily chart. So I have the PPO, I have the daily bars, I have the check and money flow and also the scooter rankings showing you how that's improved. So interestingly, EA has actually uh, improved scooter, scooter rankings slowly improving as the stock has chipped away uh, in the month of November into December. The weekly view though shows this last six to 12 months into proper perspective. So EA at one point was up in the 150 range down to 74. This is adjusted data because we're adjusting for dividends and, and other things. So it might be a little different than uh, what, what things looked over time. But this gives you a good sense of the trend of the market incorporating total return. And EA relative to the S&P 500, one of the more interesting things you can look at to understand the relative basis. And then we have the point and figure chart. And at some point, I was making a note to myself before we came on the air. I'm a huge fan of point and figure charts. I don't show them as much on this show only because I think there's a little bit of a gap, a little bit of a hurdle you have to get over to get comfortable with how to use them. But uh, when we had uh, some of our guests, Bruce Frazier comes to mind that shows point and figure charts, reminds me how we could incorporate more of them into the show. I'll try to do better with that uh, going into, uh, into the end of the year, into, uh, into the new year. So those four charts gives you a good sense, and I would start from the bottom. The point and figure gives you the trend which is positive because we're in a column of X's that has gone above the previous column of X's. The weekly chart shows you how we were in this huge range from the 150s down to the you know, low 70s. We then rallied back up just above 100. And since then, we sort of have this rounding, bottoming pattern, a base pattern uh, over the last year. And if we would break above sort of that 105 to 108 range, that would be a significant uh, change in characteristic, probably uh, include some relative strength uh, improvement as well. On the daily chart, I can see this last six months and I can see the rally, how it's been this nice consistent pattern of higher highs and higher lows and how important it is that we're relative to these highs from the last six months. Uh, scooter ranking improving, which is pretty good. And then I can look at the intraday picture to see where we're at. So what gets cool is a couple of things. Number one, you'll notice as a Stock Charts member, you'll have a little member, a little message here at the top. If you click here, it'll explain to you how you can customize these charts. So the daily, weekly, and intraday charts can all be customized to fit more with how you like to look at uh, different things. So for example, if I bring up EA and I say, you know what, I really like this. This is my default view of EA. I really like to see it. I can say uh, add new and I can call it gallery view daily and that will uh, actually allow it to, uh, to be that uh, default chart that shows when I do gallery view. I'll go back to it real quick to show you how that'll, how that'll appear. So if you save a chart style called gallery intraday, gallery daily, gallery weekly, these charts will each change to reflect the new chart style that you do. So if you find a certain set of indicators that you like to use on the daily chart, on the weekly chart, on the intraday level, uh, you can customize those. This is where it gets really interesting. I can now com uh, compare Electronic Arts to another stock in the group or something totally different. So now I'm comparing EA to Activision. And again, the way that I like to think about these is I start at the bottom. The point figure chart tells you the trend. It strips out the noise and instead of charting uh, price over time, it, it essentially charts the trend. And so a column of X's is a period of accumulation. A column of O's is a period of distribution. Electronic Arts in a bull phase, breaking above the previous high. Activision actually in more of a bearish phase because the most recent signal was a sell signal breaking below the previous column of O's in a downtrend. So overall, Electronic Arts gets the, uh, gets the nod there. In terms of the weekly view, I can see that Activision, Activision has actually held up very, very nicely above the 40-week moving average, which is interesting. Electronic Arts, a little more of a basing pattern, and I like the fact that we're up against resistance. So both of these, here I see 57.50, here I see around 105 to 108. They're both near interesting points from a, from a, from a resistance perspective I'd want to watch. On the daily chart, I can compare the two, and I can see that EA is actually broken above resistance, really testing resistance, while Activision has a little further to go. And then we can do the same uh, to wrap up with the intraday view. But now I'm looking A and B and comparing two stocks, apples to apples, same view on each one. So if you've not used that uh, technique, you can use that with any two stocks, two ETFs, two asset classes, and really relate the two to another. Make sure that you're allocated to the right uh, option of the, uh, of the two. That's our level up segment uh, talking about gallery view, which is one of the coolest features of stock charts. If you've not used it, I hope you can take some time and to experiment with that. We're going to take a brief commercial break. We're going to come back and hear from Tom Lee from Fundstrat talking about uh, cryptocurrency. So see you in a minute.
everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. Thanks for joining me every weekday here at 4 o'clock Eastern to wrap up the day's activity connected to the long term. This is Crypto Week on Stock Charts TV. All of my uh, fellow hosts have done a really good job talking about their perspective on cryptocurrency. So if you haven't watched some of the other shows on the channel, check out our YouTube channel. You're going to get some really interesting uh, takeaways of how you can think of it from a number of different perspectives, not just my own. I had a chance to sit down with Tom Lee, who's the strategist at Fundstrat in New York. Uh, Tom's been a very prolific writer and speaker on cryptocurrencies. He's done a great job trying to help individuals and institutions uh, think about cryptocurrencies and digital assets. I sat down with him at the Las Vegas Traders Expo, and I was able to ask him about how you can value, cri value cryptocurrencies, which is a nice relationship to what we've talked about, about uh, interpreting them from a technical perspective. So let's hear from Tom Lee from Fundstrat. Sitting down with Tom Lee. Tom's the co-founder and director of research for Fundstrat based in New York. With cryptocurrencies in particular, I know on stock charts, we, you know, looking at crypto data from a technical perspective, that's really our focus. Um, you know, one of the, I would say what some people think the benefits is there's limited fundamental data in general, right? It's, it's, it's very much in some ways a petri dish of behavioral biases and, and everything, but how do you think of it? Is there a good way to think of it from a fundamental perspective that marries that with the technical, looking at the charts of Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and whatever else, how do you approach it, generally speaking, from a fundamental perspective? How can we think of it that um, way? Yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, there's a true economy measurement okay. yeah. for crypto uh, because one, you know, there's the blockchain, so you can measure yeah. what's happening on the blockchain. Okay. And even though there is a, a lot of noise, and that's why, you know, services like Coin Metrics or Digital Assets Data, they try to do, a, you know, their best job to sort of clean up the the, the way the blockchains report, especially in Bitcoin, because there's the double outputs. Right. Um, you can measure activity there. Okay. But as adoption of cryptocurrencies generally grows, like through back and the idea that Starbucks and others will start to use as a payment you know, channel, mm -hmm. you're going to have a real economic measurement because you can mm. start to measure transactions. So I sure. think that the whole concept of measuring Bitcoin's economy is not well measured today because it's hard to measure the movements, but you only see the residuals through the blockchain. So I think it's right. just a matter of time. But I think there's, you know, in, in our work at, at Fundstrat, we we have shown there's, you know, simple measures that have explained a lot of the moves of Bitcoin. So one is mining okay. and break-even costs, and the other is really wallet movements. And, and so even just those two simple measures really can put you on the right side of, of Bitcoin moves. Got fundamentally. It. Right, right, right. That's great. So that was part of my conversation uh, a couple weeks ago with Tom Lee from Fundstrat down at the Las Vegas Traders Expo. Super smart guy. We had a really interesting conversation talking about cryptocurrencies, digital assets, blockchain from a number of different perspectives. But I thought his discussion about some of the ways that you could start to value cryptocurrencies, I thought was really interesting. That's been one of the biggest criticisms I've heard is that it's difficult to value a cryptocurrency based on the traditional metrics. But, you know, he started to show that there are ways to, to try and do it. As you probably know, we have added cryptocurrency data to the Stock Charts platform on your member dashboard page. You can click on the crypto link right at the top at the middle of the page. You can see all the different tickers, start to analyzing them. And I, one thing I would suggest to you, if you haven't done it already, Work up some charts where you're looking at Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency relative to other assets that you might be looking at as part of an asset allocation decision. See how the movements are related to one another. You find a lot of times they're relatively uncorrelated, which can be kind of, uh, kind of interesting. In our next segment is Fishing for Alpha. This is one of my favorite segments because it uses the power of the scanning engine on stock charts, which is one of the really cool ways you can do a bottom-up analysis, look for ideas, try to generate, uh, generate some, uh, some opportunities. So in today's edition of Fishing for Alpha, we're going to go to the scanning engine. Again, on your member dashboard, you'll have uh, your own scans. These are the scans that I've created and started to tweak over time. Uh, I'd encourage you to experiment with this and see, uh, you know, using some of the articles, what some of the other contributors have done. So some really powerful things we can do to slice up the equity universe. I want to share with you two screens if we have time. We'll see if we do um, to, uh, to just give you some things to think about. One of the things we talk about on the show pretty regularly is RSI. And, and you can see, hopefully you get a feel for how I like to chart. I tend to keep things very simple. Um, and, and again, my career has been spent mostly with professionals that are not technical analysts. So I'm, I only use things that I can readily explain and describe and validate for people. So I try to use things that are simplistic, but powerful and robust, have good results. So 
RSI is one of the main ways that I like to measure price momentum. I like to look at where the RSI is relative to some of the normal ranges. And one of the things we've talked about is when the RSI is extremely overbought. So when the RSI is above 70, that means that the stock is overbought. It's gone too high too quick. And you'd expect at some point for a little bit of a pullback. But the RSI above 80, and that's what we have here on the scanning engine, essentially the S&P 500 members. And I'm looking for an RSI above 80. What that does is it tells you stocks that are extremely overbought. So what this is going to do is capture stocks that have really accelerated um, to the upside. You'll notice I, I, I went past that pretty quick. I apologize for that. But I looked at the last five trading days because so many things have pulled back. I doubt anything would, would fit this screen today because everything's sort of sold off a little bit. But I want to find things that have been extremely overbought recently. So you can experiment with that number of days look back just to see what sort of results come in. And then you get to see what happened after that point, right? So here I see five stocks, uh, and I like to sort them by sector, but you know whatever is going to help you uh, digest them, of course. Here I like to store them in a new chart list. I'll say sure, and I'll say preserve sort, uh, sort order. And now I'll start to look at them 10 per page. This is sort of my default way of using the scanning engine. Let's go through these charts one by one very quickly, see what we can learn from it. So interestingly, the first one is in the financial sector, nothing from communication services, nothing from consumer, which tells you how those sectors have been relative to others. The first one on the list in alphabetical order by sector is financials and it's Charles Schwab. So this is a stock that's gapped higher. That's gonna juice up the RSI just a little bit because of the gap to the upside. But since then, a little bit of a pullback and we can see how the RSI went above 80 here a couple weeks ago and now has come back down below the overbought Region. So again, in general, the way that you tend to think of this is extremely overbought means it's gone up a lot. You'd expect a little bit of a pullback, but then you'd expect at least one more push higher. And so at this point, almost on the uh, on the watch list of, of things that potentially could be viable dips. You know, it, with a gap like this, it's kind of interesting as long as it remains above the upper end of that gap around 4725, 4730, maybe a compelling chart. It's a golden cross here, which is not my main way of looking at things, but I'll, I'll take anything that, that gives me a sense of what the price has done. So the first one, Charles Schwab, potentially at an interesting point here. We then have a couple healthcare names, and we've talked a number of times in recent weeks about how strong healthcare has been. So if you're not if you're not there, if you haven't looked at those names, I'd encourage you to screen through the healthcare space, look through the charts one by one if you could. But here we have Align Technologies, this is a medical supply company, gapped higher and then went above, follow through above the 200-day moving average, well above the 50-day. You can see this became overbought and remained overbought for quite a while. Was extremely overbought. Now back below that overbought region again. I'd expect at least one more push higher. So potentially a bit of accumulation occurring there. Amgen is another one. This is one of the biggest biotech names. Biotech as a group has been fantastic on an absolute, on a relative basis. And, and Amgen looking so strong certainly has been part of that. Again, recently extremely overbought, coming off a little bit, but not quite at that uh, corrective point, not, not pulling back below the overbought region just yet. We then have Autodesk, which is in the technology space, ANSA, so two tech companies, and again, pretty similar charts. So again, all of these extremely overbought, so you look at what happens next. And in general, the base case is you come out of the overbought region, at least one more push higher, and, and usually we'll, we'll often uh, have another, uh, another leg up that you can capitalize on. And again, if these are names that you like fundamentally, if you like them for the long term, these tend to be stocks that have done pretty well. They score very well on uh, the scooter rankings. So for example, ANSYS in the 98th percent percentile. So overall, really good long-term performance, maybe potentially uh, at a pullback point here as it comes out of that extremely overbought region. So that's screen number one, which is looking for S&P names with an RSI above uh, 80. The next scan I want to show you, just given the, uh, the time that we have here, is ETFs. And I'm looking for two things, a scooter ranking above 90 and an RSI less than 50. And again, just to orient you to this, um, the, the, the scanning engine's pretty busy. If you've not used it before, it's actually not that difficult. Once you get the hang of it, it's all driven by these drop downs at the bottom of the page. But I encourage you to look through, uh, Chip Anderson, our founder, did some really good videos. If you look at our YouTube channel, he walks through how to create scans, I think, that are really well done. So I'd encourage you to check out uh, his stuff. But what I'm doing right now is basically just saying I'm looking for ETFs. I'm looking for a scooter ranking or technical ranking above 90, meaning it's in the top 10th percentile based on our ranking system. And an RSI below 50, which means it scores very well, but it's pulled back in the recent, uh, recent past. So I'm going to screen on that. Sorry, I forgot to customize it. So we're going to say five days back. And again, the problem with, uh, with some of those scans is um, we, uh, whoops, sorry, I meant to look. RSI 9, forgive me for that. There we go. 
What happens is if you don't set the, uh, the look back right, you, a lot of times you will find um, some really uh, weird results because if the market comes back a little bit, uh, it won't necessarily be, uh, be reflected on there. And, uh, and as a result, you'll, uh, you'll get some strange results here. Here we go. Oh, one more time. Come on, Keller. So we're going to say group is this. Boom, run scan. Last time. On one. Here we go. There we go. Boy, the rule is customize your scans before you start the show, Keller. Sorry about that. So here we go. This is a stock that is actually, this is uh, the uh, SILJ. It's a junior silver ETF. And what's great about the scanning engine, a lot of times you will surface things that you have not seen before. This is a, an ETF that is not normally on my radar. This is one that's looking at uh, smaller stocks that are in the silver space, a little different. But what I can see here is something that's pulled back it started to accumulate. So we have a period of distribution, a period of accumulation, higher highs, higher lows. All of a sudden, and this is where I was looking a couple days back, you see the RSI dip below 50. So what I might want to look for is stocks, is ETFs like this with a strong trend, a pullback to the 50-day moving average and RSI below 50. Maybe that means it's potentially time to, uh, to accumulate. What, I, what happened just now, just so you know, when you run scans and then there are no results, don't be too worried about that. That doesn't necessarily mean the scanning engine is broken. A lot of times it just means you've screened for uh, an, an event that isn't happening right now. There might be a message in that alone, the fact that there aren't a ton of ETFs that fit that, uh, that fit that criteria. So that is our Fishing for Alpha segment, two ideas, looking at stocks that are extremely overbought, looking for ETFs with strong long-term trends and, uh, and a short-term potentially viable pullback. With our remaining time, let's go right to the three and three. So we like to look at three charts in three minutes. If you're not looked at these charts before this moment, I hope they're on your radar from here on out. So the first one is the Russell 2000 ETF. This is the IWM. I've highlighted this chart. We've looked at it before, and I've, I've illustrated this resistance level around 158 to 160. This is where the IWM has found resistance so many times uh, over, uh, over previous cycles. What's happened since then is we have this traditional breakout, a retest of support around 158, and then again, a subsequent rally. So overall, actually setting up kind of nicely. And again, there are a lot of themes we've talked about with large cap versus small cap, a lot of macro headwinds, but forget all of that when you're looking at the chart. Look at the chart, make the pure read, and then relate that back to what you've seen fundamentally and what you see geopolitically, all those things that could potentially cause the charts to evolve. Right now, I see a pattern that's actually setting up really nicely. I see the IWM retesting previous highs, and I see a relative strength that's been sideways. So if I see that start to improve, that would indicate a rotation more to small caps. The second chart of the three and three today is looking at cap tiers. So now I'm looking at the uh, IJR, which is the S&P 600 ETF. That's another small cap ETF here in green. I'm looking at mid caps in red. I'm looking at the S&P or large mega caps in black. And then this fourth line you can see here, sort of a darker blue is the IWC, which is a micro cap index. I'm starting this performance chart at uh, the low in August 5th. This is when the S&P, when large caps bottom out, you can see the fact that small mid caps all went lower. They actually bottomed out here at the last week in September. I started it with the market low in August 5th just to see how these trends have evolved relative to one another. Confirms what we saw with the first chart. The S&P large caps have led the way up almost 10.5% since that starting point when I took the, the screenshot here. Mid caps, the worst performer, but still up over 8% over that period. And then micro caps, small caps, both around 9%. So an interesting differentiation there. The third and final chart is the AAII ratings. We showed this earlier in our market recap segment, but I just wanted to highlight the fact um, that we're seeing a, a decreased number of bulls, a decreased number of bears, uh, and here I'm actually showing the difference between the two to show that how even it is. So not only are there less bulls and less bears, but we're almost equal in terms of people being bullish or bearish on the market. That's kind of unusual. You can see we spent a lot of time with one side or the other really taking control. This shows you how we're at a period of indecision, which again, if you've, if you've not seen that, certainly how the charts seem to feel with a lot of choppiness after, uh, after the correction uh, pattern the last couple of days. That is our show for today, the final bar. Thank you so much for joining us today and every weekday, 4 o'clock Eastern, for our closing bell show here. You can shoot emails, feedback, questions at any time, please, to the final bar at stockcharts.com. Also, take a look in the chat window now. You can add any uh, comments there. Go to our YouTube channel if you've not checked it out. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night.